Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is John Kingham, and I am the host and presenter for today's webinar. I've been working for Bentley, Nevada for the past 34 years. I started in our machinery diagnostic services department and traveled the U.S. and the world diagnosing machinery based upon their vibration characteristics. The past decade or so, I've been working on working as an application and solutions architect. In this role, I help our customers develop condition monitoring and protection solutions for their plants. We are recording today's session, and in order to make these videos worthwhile to you and your colleagues, we ask that you make sure that you are on mute and refrain from broadcasting your video. We will also be using the Slido app, the URL is right over here, uh, for questions. And uh, I always recommend voting for your own question. It gives it extra priority. And you can vote on other people's questions as well. As we are recording, we will wait until the end after we stop the recording to pose and answer the questions in the queue. I also have Mike Lockus on uh, to, to assist. Mike has been with us for 20 years and is uh, very, very uh, well versed in the Bentley Nevada product line. So. Without further ado, we will start. And, you know, pre-COVID, um, I was traveling around the country introducing Orbit 60 to our customers through a series of Bentley days. Um, and I would always ask the customers, hey, are you familiar with the PDF curve? Because the PDF curve helps you understand why we do condition monitoring. And, uh, Quite a number of people knew about it, and and there were still some people that did not. So I like to go over it. So we uh, start with our machine operating over here. It's trundling along, doing a great job. And we get to this point here where an impending failure mechanism is introduced into the system. And the machine keeps doing what you want it to do until you get to this point here where it has a failure, okay? So it stops doing what it is that you want it to do, okay? So there's various technologies that we use to figure out that it's going to fail. So vibration typically gives us the earliest warning. It gives us about one to nine months of warning. And, and this PDF failure uh, curve is for roller element bearings. Um, so, Again, if you have like a little pit in your ball bearing, uh, it's not going to stop that machine from running until it has gotten really, really bad, right? So vibration is going to pick that up quickly. Um, oil analysis is also going to be a good indicator. It usually gives you one to six months of advance notice. Now, I've been uh, doing the seminars for quite a while, and uh, a couple of years ago, if I ask my customers, how often are you doing oil analysis? They tell me quarterly. And the last year or so, I've been finding most of our customers have moved it up to monthly, which is good because when you do it quarterly and it only gives you a month's advance notice, you're going to miss a lot of, of failures. So I would recommend doing it even, even more often uh, than monthly. But you judge your, your program on how it works. Thermography, three to 12 weeks. You know, and I don't know any customers that are doing uh, thermography more than uh, annually. And they're usually doing it on the electrical equipment because uh, it's great for finding loose connections and so forth. Um, and then quantitative preventive maintenance task. That's a, a preventive maintenance task where you're actually measuring something. So maybe you're measuring the viscosity of the oil. That'll give you five to eight weeks. Um, audible noise, one to four weeks. Um, back when I was doing MDS work, which again was 30 years ago, uh, customers would call up and they'd say, hey, you know, the vibration levels have been high, but now my, my uh, operator is hearing something different with the machine, it's time to come in and, and look at it. Okay. Um, eight to the touch, one to five days. And then uh, smoke is a very good indicator that you have a problem. But as you can imagine, it does not give you much time to, to uh, react. Okay. 
So we say that if you're listening for audible noise, feeling your bearings for heat, and looking for smoke, you're down here in the reactive side of the curve. Whereas we want you to do condition monitoring and be up here on the proactive side of the curve, the top of the curve. And life at the top is going to give you, you know, time to plan and schedule your, your uh, work. Parts can be ordered in advance, so you don't have to uh, keep as many on site, so less inventory costs. You have lower repair costs because you can schedule it. It doesn't have to be done on overtime. Um, likewise, there's less impact on operations because, again, you can schedule it and maybe there's other machines that need to come down at the same time and so forth. So you can make it easy on operations. And then you have time and data to analyze the failure. So you can mitigate it uh, so it doesn't happen again, hopefully. And then less rework because you're not following that uh, hurry and fix it fast mentality. So that's the P to F curve. Um, and, and it's very well known in the reliability world. Um, so if you have any other questions on that, please please put them in the Slido. I've got the Slido uh, up here. I'd be more than happy to address them. So we know that we want to do condition monitoring, but how do we do condition monitoring? Well, at Bentley, Nevada, we've developed a plant-wide architecture where we use System 1. System 1 is your repository for all of your uh, machinery information. We start over here on the, the far left, and this is more of our protection-based equipment. So Orbit 60, 3500, 3701 ADAPT, and the 2320. Now I guess the 1965A all have relays. So they're continuously looking at your sensors, which are mounted down here, and making an assessment as to whether they're below or above the alert and danger level. Okay. You go over here to the right, we've got our VB Online Pro, which is a wired scanning system. We have the Ranger Pro, which we are going to talk about today, and it's a wireless scanning system. Um, and then you have your portables, like your VB7, VB8, and your Scout series, which you use for walk-around programs. And we can also take in uh, process data through OPC. But the beauty is that all of this data resides right up here on the System 1 server. So you only learn one program and you only have to maintain one program, one platform. So again, you have your sensors coming into these various instruments. Um, from a Bentley, Nevada perspective, we also offer that 360 degree approach to customer service. So we have implementation services here. These are the guys that will go out and retrofit machines, design brackets, so forth. Uh, They'll manage electrical subs and mechanical subs and uh, install monitors, make sure everything is working properly before you come out of your outage. Um, proactive support, we've got remote monitoring and diagnostic centers. We have uh, six worldwide. One of them is in Minden, Nevada, which is where those of us in the United States and Canada typically go. And then asset health and consulting, that's pretty much our MDS group. Um, training and education. Our training is, and I don't want to toot the horn too much, but um, our training is really good. About 50% of the training is hands-on, and there's no better way to learn than doing. So we have various courses, and we have pivoted, and we're now offering some of those courses online. So you can actually... You'll have a set time that you go. You'll have a live instructor. There will be other people in the class. And um, we'll have like a video camera that's on the uh, rotor kits, and you can control the rotor kits remotely so you get that same lab experience. Um, next best thing to be in there. And then uh, cybersecurity, we can help you with your cybersecurity concerns surrounding our equipment as well. So we have a service organization devoted to that as well. So that's condition monitoring and how we do it. Let's move back to uh, the Ranger Pro. So the Ranger Pro is a wireless system and everybody who 
we talked to about wireless system has some, some common questions, such right. as what is the range? What's the distance between the sensor and the gateway? And the protocols, are they proprietary or open? So, you know, we use a, an ISA 100 standard, which is an open protocol. That means that other instruments, like uh, there's, you know, flow meters by Rosemont and, and so forth, they can talk through our network or we can join their network. Um, it makes it more robust system. Uh, data bandwidth and frequency, are you getting just simple data or are you getting rich data? And how often are you getting it? The power source. Uh, because it is wireless, uh, everything's going to be run on batteries. So what's the battery life? How available are those batteries? And how easy is it to maintain? And then security. Everybody wants to know. Uh, they're afraid of their vibration data getting out into the world. Um, one of my customers on the other day when we were talking about this said, you know, you bank over your phone, you uh, walk up to your car with a key fob and get in and drive away, and you're worried about your vibration getting out? Well, it's, it's a concern. People have that concern. We have 128-bit uh, encryption, which is better than bank uh, security. And one thing that's not on this slide that I think is important is area classifications. So can you put your sensors in a hazardous area? Okay. So those are some of the topics that we're going to talk about and uh, hopefully answer your questions there. So um, going back to the slide on system one, I just want to highlight this customer uh, quote. She said, by having the Ranger Pro wireless platform combined with the portable platform, and the continuous platform will give us the advantage of having one software manage all three, one, a one-stop shop for all vibration readings. And that is, that is so true and, and is the basis of why we made System 1, System 1. Okay. So let's talk about wireless condition monitoring and, and the fit, right? So there's a couple of different ways you can monitor equipment. Um, you know, most typically, uh, you know Bentley, Nevada for our, our protection systems. So that's wired uh, continuous monitoring and condition monitoring as well. You get higher point counts. It's got the fastest sampling rate because it's sampling continuously. And it's capable of doing protection. Um, you wouldn't want to use a handheld route, for example, where you're taking data once a month for protection, because you could have a failure uh, an hour after the guy leaves, and uh, you won't know it for another month, right? So you need to have continuous sampling to have protection. And then the other thing that uh, can, you know our continuous wired monitors can do is accept different sensor types. Um, they're not limited to Excel. So they can have thermometers, proximity probes, pressure transducers, temperature sensors, etc. Um, on the other end of the scale is the portable solution, which is your walk around. So there you have a single instrument and a single Excel typically. And uh, you walk around and you stick your Excel on the machine and you take, the data, take some data. And uh, obviously you can walk up to as many machines as you like. So uh, from that sense, it's virtually unlimited the number of uh, points that you can, you can hit. And the more points you hit, the less it costs per point, by the way. So um, you have that. And then uh, wireless condition monitoring. You've got a broader asset coverage. It is simple to deploy. It's fast to expand. It is very cost effective. But it does give you periodic measurements. I'm going to kind of summarize this down here. So data frequency, you know, portable, getting it once a month, that's good. Wireless is much better. Um, see if I can find where I hid my math. And then wired is best. So just to give you an idea, we recommend taking a sample every two hours, a static sample every two hours, and a waveform every day. So uh, when you're taking 
a sample every two hours, that's 12 samples a day, and over 30 days, that's 360 yeah. samples. So that is much denser data. And you can get a much better trend out of that than getting a point today and a point a month from now. Okay, and then from a from a wave storm wave form standpoint, you're getting one a day, so now you're getting 30 waveforms or spectrums um, over the time where you would only have one. So you get a much richer data set and can understand what's going on better. Now, those are our recommendations. We can take uh, data as fast as every 10 minutes for static samples, and that would give you 4,320 samples in a month. Um, or you could take your waveforms every six hours, if you four a day or 120 samples during a month. Um, now, that's going to cost you a little bit in battery life, and we'll talk about battery life in, in a bit, but typically you should expect five five years of battery life um, at the two hour and, and once per day rate. Now, if you move it up to 10 minutes and the waveform four times a day, uh, you might shave off an, a year or a year and a half. So not, not bad. Okay. So value, productivity, you're going to have more assets under surveillance and more frequent asset information. So you're taking more data. So it's more frequent, more rich. Um, hazardous or difficult to access areas. Uh, Ranger Pro is, is rated for Zone 0 or Class 1 Div 1. So you can put that sensor in a hazardous area where, if you think about it, you really don't want to be sending people on a regular basis. So if you can keep your people out of those areas, use a Ranger Pro. It's much better from a HSE standpoint as well. It does have that 128-bit AES encryption. Of course, everything is digital, so it is fully connected. And it has a low installation deployment cost. You're not wiring things, and that's where where things get very expensive. I guess I I, I stopped on my uh, little chart here at data frequency, but installation and deployment. You know, the portable. Um, you have somebody walking up to a machine every day. You know, that's, you've got a cost there. Wireless, you install it. You forget about it. It's it's the best for installation and deployment. Wired is good, but you do have um, electrical costs that are that are quite high sometimes. Sampling rates, again, portable. You're taking that data once a month, so it's good. Um, wireless is better. I gave you the numbers for that, and then uh, the wired solution is continuous, so it's best. And again, I do want to stress uh, that protection is, Ranger Pro is not for protection. It is only taking data every so often, so you wouldn't want to shut down on it. You have to use wired uh, continuous for that. And as far as investment goes, again, for the portable instrument, you're buying one instrument, you're buying one uh, Excel with it, so it's fairly inexpensive. The wireless significantly better than uh, the wired cost because you don't have the uh, electrical installations. Okay. So with that, we'll move on to Ranger Pro specific information. And I love this slide because it, it shows how the system, you know, how that Ranger Pro sensor goes together, if you will. You have the stainless steel body with a single axis or triaxial Excel, and that's a piezoelectric uh, accelerometer that's embedded in the base along with uh, a temperature sensor. And I stress that it is a piezoelectric uh, Excel because some of our competitors are using MEMS technology. And the MEMS technology is the same Excel that you have in your cell phone. It doesn't have a very good frequency response. They're very... Uh, now they're inexpensive to build, and you get inexpensive results with them. So if you're doing roller element bearing analysis, you need higher frequency analysis. MEMS just doesn't do it for you. 
So you have have the case. You'll notice it's got an O-ring here. Then we have a standard D cell, D size um, lithium thionyl chloride battery. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about it. You have a retaining nut, and then you have this E module, which is a radio, and you'll see it also has a uh, an O-ring on it. And then you have the retaining ring that holds everything together. Okay. Again, zone zero, class one, div one. It is truly wireless. Um, and this is our second generation wireless product. We had a product called Essential Insight at Mesh that was considerably larger. It was built on the same ISA 100.11a uh, protocol, but it, it was considerably larger, used proprietary batteries, and it had four wires that came off of it that went to the individual um, excels and thermocouples. This is uh, much smaller, more rugged, and more reliable. So, again, those excels give you, you know, all-in-one vibration measurements. You've got velocity, 5 to uh, a kilohertz, excel from 5 to 10 kilohertz, and then the z-axis, which is the axis along the length here, you'll also get um, demodulated excel, which is what you use for roller element bearings to give you the earliest indication of what's going on. And then you also get temperature. Um, and I know this question will come up later, so we also are going to provide a battery uh, power level as well. So um, you get the trended values, which are going to be overalls for acceleration and velocity um, and the temperatures. And then you also get waveforms and spectrums. And I, I'm separating those two because um, you'll see on the next two slides or a couple slides that the trended values, the static values, are available from the gateway directly through Modbus. So they can go directly to your DCS. You don't technically need system one to use this system. Um, to get the best bang for the buck, you do need system one because that's where you can look at spectrums and waveforms. So it does have full system one connectivity. Um, the network is auto-forming self-healing ISA 100 wireless network protocol. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We mentioned the replaceable lithium thionyl chloride battery. What I didn't tell you is I buy mine from Amazon. They cost me less than $20 a piece, and uh, I just find that to be an easy way to, to get them. Uh, I understand that uh, there's you know local battery uh, stores like Battery Plus and some other stores that may carry them locally for you as well. We will sell them to you. Um, we prefer not to because of the shipping requirements. They have to be shipped by a ground. They can't be shipped by an air. So uh, we do charge a hefty premium, and we're upfront about that. We would prefer you buy your batteries from Amazon or somebody else. Um, the electronics are IP67 hermetically sealed, have a temperature rating of minus 40C to 85, plus 85C. And that temperature rating is basically based on the batteries. The electronics can handle uh, temperatures less than or above that temperature range, but the battery um, is not good at doing that. So when you get to the very low temperatures, it takes a lot of battery life to um, maintain operation. Same same with the very high temperatures. So uh, just keep those in mind. Um, we have a range here of 150 meters. Typically, uh, we say 150 to 200 meters line of sight. So uh, when you're in the radio world, you talk mountaintop to mountaintop. Nothing in between. So in your typical industrial environment, that you don't have that. So we typically are going to rate it at about 100 meters between uh, sensors. Talked about the encryption. 
I talked a little bit about this, but you do have Modbus output to the DCS or the plant historian for the trended variables. That's going to be the overall amplitudes of your velocity and acceleration, uh, your peak um, DMOD, and your temperatures, and, and your battery health. But then you uh, have an interface with trended values and waveforms to system one. So that's where you'll look at your waveforms and spectrum. And I mentioned this earlier, but your battery life is up to five years. Uh, one other thing that's not on the slide that I forgot to mention is this base here. The diameter is just slightly under an inch. So if you have a one inch spot face, um, it's perfect for mounting these. Now, as far as mounting goes, uh, there are a couple other options. It does have a, uh, a female pole that is threaded for quarter 28. So, and we have adapters for metric sizes, but uh, you can do the quarter 28, or you can epoxy these onto the, your, your machine. Um, just be aware that the epoxy sometimes does not transmit temperature as well as the metal to metal uh, temperature. Um, and you can also use a magnet. Typically, um, though, the magnets are really going to do a poor job of transferring the thermal energy. So you might not get accurate temperatures. And if you don't have it positioned right, you may lose some of the high frequency uh, content as well. But you would have that same loss in a uh, walk around program as well. So, so where would we typically apply uh, Ranger Pro? All these types of machines, specifically uh, machines that have roller element bearings are a great fit. Um, we wouldn't want to, for example, in this picture, we wouldn't want to put it on the steam turbine. Steam turbines have sleeve bearings. Sleeve bearings are, are much better uh, monitored with proximity probes. But anything with a roller element bearing is good. Uh, I have these in operation up in Alaska uh, at a power plant and cooling towers working well. So uh, that's a good, good uh, location for them. Here are some pictures of a test that we were doing just to verify that we had good communications within the system. So we had a question the other day, What's what are these blue things? The blue things are magnets. So I just got through telling you, don't use magnets. Well, don't use magnets when you're monitoring something. But we were just mounting these temporarily to make sure that we had good communication. You'll see that this, this particular Ranger Pro is kind of nestled in a lot of metal. We still got good, good uh, communication out this way. Um, you'll also find that these radio waves will bounce off of, of uh, metal, and so they can ricochet and actually get you further than you thought you would. Um, so the best way to do it is to put the system out there and check make sure it works. Our service organization can do that for you. So how does the data flow? Um, you have your Ranger Pro sensor. It's going to be talking over ISA 100, and it's going to go to one of these field access points. This is a Yokogawa one. This one is a Honeywell one. And then the Yokogawa and Honeywell both have management stations, or we call them uh, gateways, that take this data and then transfer it. So they can do Modbus, again, the trended variables, overall vibration levels, the battery health, the uh, temperature, can go to the plant historian and DCS. Or everything can be going to System 1, uh, and that would include the waveforms and spectrums. So under development, we have, by popular demand, wireless heart radios coming. Um, I believe that they are coming in August. Um, and they'll be using the Emerson 1410 or 1420 gateway. And um, so it doesn't have the, the field access point and the and the gateway is just built all in one. Again, you can get your Modbus data out to your DCS and plant historian, and you can take the rest of the data to system one. Okay. Um, in October, 
we will be coming out with our own Bentley Nevada branded um, gateway as well. And it will be a single unit as well, so it'll be the access point and the gateway all in one unit. Um, now system one is where we're going to feed all of our uh, data to. So you're going to get trending of those overall values. You're going to be able to do analysis on your spectras and uh, waveforms. And of course, you'll also see the battery life. Um, and with system one, you can set up alerts, uh, typically software alerts one and two, that can be emailed to you and, and so forth to let you know when something is, has gone above a certain level. Um, I always think that it's a smart idea to set up a, a an alert when your battery level goes uh, to 25. So you'll see here, here's our power supply status of 75. That's a, a good battery. You'll, a brand new battery will give you a 75. If you were wired, it would give you 100. But that's an ISA 100 protocol. So you'll get a reading of either 75, 50, or, or 25. Uh, back to system one, we have three tiers of system one. Uh, the premium has everything below it, but it uh, is going to be where you have your Orbit 60, your 3500, your ADAPT systems, your continuous monitoring and protection systems, all that data coming in. Um, your Ranger Pro is going to come in in the advanced tier. So uh, that'll be typically your, your critical equipment. Your BB Online Pro, 30, uh, 2320, Trendmaster, um, and then process data coming in through advanced. Um, and then fundamental, which is your less critical machines, will be your your portables and walk-around uh, products, the Scout and uh, VB7, VB8s. So you ask, John, how do you deploy uh, uh, Ranger Pro? And I'm glad you asked. First of all, again, these are going to be the ISA 100 guidelines. Um, and it's going to be either a Honeywell or Yokogawa setup um, with 40 Ranger Pros max recommended per access point. So the Yokogawa can have four access points per gateway. So that gives you 160 uh, Ranger Pros, and then the Honeywell can, can do eight access points per gateway, or 320. My understanding is Yokogawa is about to release uh, a firmware upgrade that will allow you to do eight access points as well. And I said that I've got 100 meters between the Ranger Pro and the access point. So what do I do if I have distances that are greater than 100 meters? Well, the, the ISA 100 protocol is a mesh network protocol. So you can have 100 meters from the access point to the first Ranger Pro, 100 meters to the next Ranger Pro, and another 100 meters to the third Ranger Pro, giving you 300 meters away from that gateway. So this Ranger Pro is going to talk to this Ranger Pro. This Ranger Pro is going to transfer or relay that information to this Ranger Pro, which is then going to, to uh, send it to the field access point. Now, this is not the ideal situation uh, where all of the Ranger Pros are going to be repeating through a single Ranger Pro. That puts a lot of load on this. So we would prefer to see a couple extra Ranger Pros here. The other thing that, that you might notice is, what if I lose this connection here? Say a truck drives in and breaks this communications. Well, this guy's still talking to this Ranger Pro, and they're both transferring all that data back. So you may lose this connection, but you won't lose the data because the data is always going to travel at, down at least two paths. And, oh, by the way, this guy over here, the device manager, the gateway, that's the brains of the organization. It says, you know, these two guys didn't communicate with each other. There must be a fault in the network. So... Let's just say there's a, 
another Ranger Pro over here. I'm going to direct traffic to this this Ranger Pro and this Ranger Pro instead of from here to here. So it it'll reroute and mend the uh, the network, heal the network, so to speak. So um, number of hops, we really don't recommend more than three. It can be done, but it's just not as robust. So you should plan on, on no more than three hops. And here's some deployment setups a little more in depth. We'll start over here at the right. This is good. You've got one hop here, one hop here, one hop to uh, the gateway. It, it'll work, but it's not going to be as robust as, say, this example, where we have the ability to go to two different routes. Okay, so that's better. The best would be that you have only one hop between the Ranger Pro and the and the gateway. Now that being said, I'd still probably make these guys all repeaters because that way this guy can talk to this guy and this guy and if he loses communication the data is still going to get back to the home base okay. and in fact in the wireless heart uh, protocol all of the ranger pros will be set up as repeaters so that's just the way that protocol works ISA 100, they don't have to be set up that way. So let's talk about the sensor battery. Um, when you get your Ranger Pro, it will not have a battery installed in it. Okay, So it will be shipped uninstalled. Um, the battery can be shipped to you uninstalled or separately, or you can supply it through Amazon or Batteries Plus or some other supplier. Okay. So when the battery is installed, the Range Pro sensor will be unprovisioned, um, and it will stay most of the time in sleep mode. It will wake up every so often, and it will look for a wireless network nearby. If it finds one, great. It's going to try and join that network. If it doesn't, it's going to go back to sleep, and it will wake up again in a little while and look for that, that network. Okay? So I do want to talk about these batteries. These are two very specific batteries that we uh, recommend that you use. Um, and if you fail to use them, if you use different batteries, it will void the class one div one uh, classification and it will also void your warranty. We do offer, by the way, uh, just with all of our hardware products, a three year warranty on these. Um, but the reason we we selected these two batteries is that we went through extensive, extensive testing. We put them on uh, shaker tables, we heated them, we cooled them, and we found that there are a lot of batteries out there that, that aren't that rugged. So, um, again, $20 on Amazon, uh, you know, if you can find one for $15, You've, you've saved five dollars, but you've created a headache for yourself. Um, and, I, and I will point out that while we were testing, we did have one of the uh, one of the batteries let go, and we had lithium uh, you know, a lithium spill basically it had to be cleaned up, and we had to stop our testing, and uh, took took about two to three months of HSC and. Uh, putting protocols in place to make sure that it didn't happen again. Um, and that was during our development cycle. It didn't cost us a lot of time. So we're pretty adamant about using one of those two types of batteries. And we recommend that. So um, this is a, a view of the Honeywell Wireless Device Manager. This is somebody has logged in with the IP address. You've got an administrative password, and this is what you see. So you see in this particular network, there's two access points, um, and then there's looks like eight eight different sensors, and they're all green, which means that they're they've joined and they've been accepted. If if I turned a uh, Ranger Pro on right now, it would come on, and you would see blue. Um, and then up here, 
it's kind of grayed out because everything's been accepted. But if if you had a Ranger Pro that was trying to join, here is where you would accept it. So just another level of security where you have to accept that um, sensor into the network. I also notice that you know we've got a Rosemont transducer here, uh, a MacTech transducer. I don't know MacTech, but you know you probably have flow flow going here and so forth. So all these different sensors can can form a a mesh network. Um, I also notice you know that this guy's a repeater and this fellow's a repeater as well, um, and and they have a lot of con connections to these sensors, um, but those sensors are also directly connected to the access points as well. So, um, Another neat thing that you can do with this software is you can overlay an aerial map or a picture of your own choosing, could be, uh, could be a plant diagram, what have you. Um, and all those, I, I will say that the software is not smart enough to know, these are not GPS centric. Um, probes, but you can move them just by picking them up uh, with your left mouse and dragging them to where you want them to be. And that gives you a, a great graphical representation of where the sensors are and where the paths of data are going. So here I have, you know, back when I was traveling, um, I'd set the Ranger Pro system up in my hotel room the night before. I always like to make sure that my systems are working before I demonstrate them. And I uh, always like to get a little data, right? Everybody wants to see a little data. So um, I'm only going to point out right here that this particular sensor, when I got into the, uh, the ballroom that we were presenting in, I put the sensor right next to the exhaust of the projector, and that projector gets pretty hot, so that's why we have that spike there. But I am zeroing in on this data, which I took in in my hotel room the night before. So I put one of my Ranger Pros on the vent of the air conditioning system, or the heater in this particular case, because it's back in March. Um, and then you can see that it cycles on and off, on and off throughout the night. And then this sensor is, you know, on the dresser or someplace in there. It shows that, you know, the the room temperature stayed fairly constant throughout that. And then I guess probably before I went to bed I decided let's let's just put one of the sensors in the fridge. Um, and this was a good fridge. There were other uh instances where I did this where my fridge only got down to 50 degrees. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really glad I'm not putting something perishable in there and have, trying to have it for breakfast. So um, always good to check your fridge at the hotel. Okay. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about enhancements because this is a product that we are currently investing in and uh, we're making improvements to. So in August, we talked about having the wireless heart capabilities coming out. It's going to have the same form, fit, and function as the ISA 100 uh, system. It will only be coming with triaxial excels. Uh, we found that uh, in the ISA 100 world, uh, there's only a $100 difference between the single axis and the triaxis, and virtually nobody was buying the single axis. So. Uh, just to make wireless heart triaxial. Even though it's going to be communicating through an Emerson device, a gateway, we will have full System 1 connectivity. And again, it will be compatible with 1410 and 1420. Okay. And we're adding some other advanced analytics that's going to apply to both the ISA 100 and the wireless heart systems. So data on severity. So um, I talked to you about taking a static sample every two hours and a waveform every every day. But we've we've set this up so now if you exceed a minimum threshold, 
to take data. So you say maybe you have it set at 0.15 inches per second or something like that. Now you're at 0.16. What it will do is it will default to the maximum frequency of data collection. So it will default to taking a sample every 10 minutes and a waveform every six hours. So you'll get that rich, dense data to do a, a good, thorough analysis. When it drops below the 0.15 inches per second, it'll go back to its regularly scheduled uh, sample rate. Um, along the same lines, we have this machine on and off, take data or not. So here you might set a uh, minimum threshold of uh, 0.5 inches per second. And if the sensor turns on and it says, hmm, we're at 0.4, I don't, I don't need to take data because nobody cares. Um, but what it will do is send a, a message back through the gateway saying, hey, I did I did uh, turn on, I looked, I saw that the data wasn't very interesting, and I'm not transmitting that to you. So that way you know that your machine is still operating well, um, you're just not taking data. Otherwise you might think, oh, maybe I have a bad sensor. So no, we want to make sure that you don't think that. Um, and then take data on demand, take data now. So in system one, you'll be able to push a button and uh, take data. Now, keep in mind this is wireless and there's hops involved. So you're not going to get instantaneous data, but you should get data within the next uh, eight to 10 minutes or so um, that, that shows you uh, what's going on right now. Then in September, and I think I said August or October earlier in the presentation, but September, uh, we'll have the Bentley Nevada Gateway. It is ISA 100 only, um, and with that, it's also only tested with Ranger Pro. So we're not going to guarantee that uh, a Rosemont transducer is going to go through that network as well. But it will work well with the Ranger Pro system. Is a smaller scale industrial applications, uh, no more than 50 Ranger Pros per gateway. And it is an all in one unit, so you don't have that field device and the gateway is just all self contained. And it is class one div two. So um, I do know that the Honeywell system, at least, you have the capability of getting a class one div one field device. So if you need that, Honeywell is the way to go. Otherwise, we'll have you covered. Okay. Um, before we get into questions and answers, I did want to kind of demonstrate to you um, the Ranger Pro configuration software. I've got a unit that I just put down on my USB uh, station. And in this particular case, we have a status of radio joined, and um, it's a single axis unit. I'm going to go into sensor maintenance, and I'm going, oh, by the way, look at this. My office, it's disgusting, 80 degrees. I need to turn my air conditioning up. But at any rate, I'm going to reboot this, and I'm going to take it off of the pad. And I've got another Ranger Pro sensor here, and I'm going to put it on the pad and we'll take a look at it. So um, this is a triax unit. It is joined to my network. And I want to go through here. We've got, you know, this is where you can specify how often do I want to take my overall values. So I've got it set on 10 minutes because I really don't care about battery life. You know, $20 for five years, pretty damn good. So, um, but I could set it as, far as every six hours if I wanted to. Um, and again, this vibration, acceleration, so forth. Um, our, our waveforms, you could set it to take a waveform every 28 days if you wanted to. Okay, that will give you the same uh, kind of data richness that you get from a walk-around program. Um, I 
again, showing my, my office at 80 degrees. Um, over here, we look at our acceleration overall. Um, I can do it in Gs. I can do it in meters per second squared. I can do peak or RMS. Okay. What's my F min? What's my F max? Same thing for velocity. I can do inches per second or millimeters per second. Again, peak or RMS. Set my F min, F max. Um, I have my peak D mod enabled and um, acceleration waveforms. So I've got my Z, X, and Y axes, um, and my F min is 5, and I've got F max of 5,000 for the, uh, I'm sorry, those are X and Y, and then my Z can go to 10,000. And then my samples, I can go up to 8,192 samples. And then uh, for my velocity spectrum, um, F min, F max, and I could go to a 3200 line spectrum. It's going to take a little bit longer because of the physics. It's going to drain a little bit more of your battery, but probably not much. And then you've got your peak D mod spectrum as well. So all your settings there. Um, I'm going to take this sensor off, and I'm going to go back to the other one and see where we are in the, no, it's already joined the network. So see how fast that was? Pretty quick. So that's that's that for the demo. And uh, ready to go in and ask questions. Let me uh, let me stop the recording. And uh, first of all, before I stop the recording, thank you for coming and thank you for your attendance. Appreciate it.